Let's talk about breast milk and placentas. Now, I'm not a doctor, but my parents wanted me to be one, so I think I'm qualified to talk about this. In the past, the Japanese thought that the placenta, the umbilical cord, and breast milk didn't fully belong to the mother or her baby. These things were in between the two, and the Japanese had a habit of thinking that in between things were special. We're gonna talk about the surprising beliefs people had about breast milk and especially placentas in the adult period, because I love you. People back then thought that breast milk and the placenta were the most important parts of the baby life support system. People were pretty smart. They understood that the fetus took nutrients from the mother, that the nutrients came through the umbilical cord, and then they made up a bunch of crap. Doctors noticed that when a mother's period resumed a few months after giving birth, she started making less milk. So logically, they deducted that menstrual blood and breast milk were related. Jesus turned water into wine, and Japanese women turned menstrual blood into breast milk. A more useful miracle. Doctors concluded that the mother's body fed her baby menstrual blood through the placenta and umbilical cord. After the baby was born, the blood changed into breast milk so she could feed the baby outside of her body. Sometime later, her body had to prepare for the next pregnancy, so it bloop 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 changed the breast milk back into menstrual blood. That was why when mothers started getting regular periods again, their breast milk disappeared. Makes total sense if you think about it very little. Of course, today we know that it's the breastfeeding that delays the menstrual cycle. That's right, regular breastfeeding gives you a much lower chance of getting pregnant. It's a form of birth control. Don't want a baby? Then just have a baby. Another common belief was the blood cycle, where the mother's blood traveled through the placenta and the umbicord to the fetus's liver, to its heart, then to the rest of its body. Then, after all that, the blood moves back through the umbicord, returning to the mother's body, completing the circle of life blood. There were a lot of milk beliefs, which makes sense. Milk was important. There was no good replacement for mother's milk, except for the milk of another mother, and the other baby wouldn't have appreciated that. One popular idea was that the mother's milk traveled through the umbicord to her baby. Another way to say umbilical cord was the rope of the milk. People thought that in month seven of pregnancy, the fetus leveled up and gained the ability to have senses, including the sense of taste. It would start finding the milk sweet and delicious. In the ninth month, it would become a raging milkaholic, drinking more than two liters in one night and neglecting its wife and kids. Breastfeeding was a continuation of the milk feeding that was already happening in the womb. They thought miscarriages happened when the fetus stopped drinking milk. If the mother did anything to shake up the womb, like falling or lifting heavy things or doing a belly flop, the fetus might go, ah, why, mommy, and quit drinking milk and then die. Fetuses may have the sense of taste, but they have no common sense at all. People thought milk was so important that outside of the womb, they blamed any baby death that they couldn't explain on the lack of milk. Sometimes the government gave poor couples money to buy breast milk, or to buy drugs to speed up milk production, or to buy a wet nurse. Breast milk to a baby was like daddy's money to a rich kid. He can't live without sucking on it. This idea spelled disaster for some in the baby community, though. If a mother could not provide milk, like if she was sick or if she died, the family sometimes chose to abandon the child in the woods or something. They figured, hey, the child would have died anyway. Another milk belief was that the mother's milk contained the mother's personality. Why did people think this? Because they collected studies from the university of their asses. People thought that when a woman breastfed her baby, she transferred her thoughts and fears and desires into the baby. That's why many parenting books told people not to use wet nurses. They told women to breastfeed their children with their own milk as much as possible. Since mom's anxieties could transfer to her baby, she had better make sure to stay healthy in mind and body. Think good thoughts. Only bad mothers had depression. One doctor wrote that breast milk was the same as blood. Mother and child were of the same blood, so it was natural for a mother to feed her child with her own blood. Problem was, the elites hired wet nurses all the time. Ain't nobody got time to breastfeed in the middle of plotting to backstab friends. So parenting experts were like, okay, okay, if you must hire a wet nurse, choose someone who's thoughtful, who doesn't get too excited, and someone who's quiet. This mind-sharing milk power gave parents yet another responsibility to juggle, besides protecting the child from harm and avoiding backstabs from friends. If your kid grew up to be a bad person or lazy or dumb or whatever, it could have been because of something you did while pregnant. 
And so teaching started in the womb. Moms tried to stay in comfortable environments to reduce stress and get rid of bad thoughts. They tried to avoid making mistakes when doing something or talking to someone because the baby inside could pick up those mistakes. Good posture was important, eating healthy foods, not looking at inappropriate or ugly things, not listening to filthy music like the shamisen. Don't be stupid because you could pass on your stupidity to your child. Oh, and if a mother saw large fires, it could stress out the bebe, and it might be born with a red birthmark, obviously. Now, umbrellas are quite handy. They protect you from the rain, and they eliminate your political enemies. But what does a placenta umbrella do? So far, we've talked about how living in the womb was pretty sweet. You got free food, free rent, a free personality. It was a great place to stay until they evicted you by pushing your body through the keyhole of your front door. But the womb wasn't all sunshine and roses. People thought anything having to do with reproduction, like menstrual blood, was polluting, dirty, in a spiritual way. But wait, didn't we say before that menstrual blood was good? So it was both good and bad? Yeah, basically. Mommy could send both good and bad vibes to her baby. Luckily, the placenta was there to protect the baby. People thought that fetuses sat upright in the womb with the placenta above, like the little muffins holding an umbrella, protecting it from the poisons and pollution raining down from its mother. They realized later that fetuses actually sat upside down in the womb, but the image stuck. They thought this pollution could cause diseases like smallpox, the mother's blood flowing into the baby was poisonous if not for the placenta filtering it. Amniotic fluid, that liquid that the baby swam in, was also supposed to be toxic. After the delivery, people rushed to remove amniotic fluid from the baby's mouth before the little dummy swallowed it. It was also a great idea to let the baby poop as much as possible to get rid of all the amniotic fluid in its body. They even gave weak poopers laxatives to help them out. Strong chad poopers were praised. There was some contradicting info on whether breast milk helped or hampered this initial toxin extraction. Doctors told women not to breastfeed until all the toxins have been removed, because breast milk would mix with the toxins and make things harder. But later in the adult period, most doctors thought breast milk helped remove the toxins. So, what did they do with the placenta afterwards? During childbirth, you actually deliver two things, the bebe and the placenta. The Japanese thought that must mean the two are connected spiritually. It seems like people saw the placenta as a partner of the baby, or even a part of the baby, until the baby was recognized as a person by society. But the loyal placenta did not stop protecting its buddy after birth, oh no. Treat the placenta properly and it would bring good fortune and health to the child. Treat it poorly and it would bring disaster. Placenta burial rituals became a thing among the elites. They usually had three steps, purification, wrapping, and burial. The placenta was steeped in all those dirty mother juices like blood and amniotic fluid, so it needed purification. People cleansed it with water, sake, or vinegar. They wrapped it in something like cloth or silk and put it in a box, then picked a lucky spot to bury it. These rituals could get complicated, with people burying all kinds of things with it. Commoners started doing these rituals too, but made them simpler. Some people even buried the placenta directly into the ground to let it rot and return to the soil. They thought it had fertility energy. Like how a root grows into a plant, a placenta may grow into another pregnancy for the family in the near future, if you're lucky. If you're not lucky, it may grow into a placenta tree, which just ruins the look of your front yard. Alright, for more videos like this, check these out. We have some new patrons on Patreon. Sakamoto Shinonome, Rafael Chagas, Amy Burnett, Catherine Brito, Vanessa Smiakia, Vanessa Smiakia, and Emily the Stork, bringing us some bebes. All right, I love you and spread the knowledge.